welcome to the Master's Touch Even Song Service. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Let the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, pleasing to you. The meditation of my heart be pleasing. Did you come expecting to receive tonight? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from the Lord. Elevate your expectation level, my friends, and open your hearts to receive Him. Now, as we begin our worship tonight, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread, a cracker, some sort of a bite of food, and a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. It can even be water. Just gather those things and set them aside. Later on, we're going to pray over them, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. Let's begin by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, open wide, expecting to receive your word and revelation knowledge. 
Our worship, love, gratitude, and devotion for you flows freely from our hearts and through our lips. We love you, magnify you, and praise your precious holy name. Lord, we thank you and praise you that we believers are seated in heavenly places in Christ, that we abide in the secret place of the Most High. And we thank you that your word tells us that you've already heard our prayers. Thank you that your word says that all of your answers for the believers' prayers are yes and amen. We thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God and the logos word of God. We thank you for impartation and revelation knowledge. We thank you that the healing power of God's present here to heal all who come to you in faith and in need. And we give you thanks and praise for your only begotten son and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. We thank you that we are totally healed, made whole and completely restored to divine health and wholeness. And we give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise in the name above all names, the matchless name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Right now, folks, let's worship our King. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. As if I had never sinned For if I had to list my failures I wouldn't know where to begin Who am I to not forgive you? God's forgiven me If it wasn't for compassion I don't know where I would be chosen to forget there is no more 
stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long live the world in sin and pining till he. We're about to enter the throne room of God, my friends. And in order to be able to receive 
in that place we must enter into the spirit in a deeper depth. The door to that depth is soaking in worship. So soak with me now. Well, you can tell it's Christmas, <laughs> but let me ask you tonight, do you know how to receive from God? Now, most often we're told that it's easy to be a Christian, just believe and receive. Excuse me, I sneezed just before I came back on the air. Pardon me. Okay, I don't really have too much of a problem believing, only on the hard things like healing and stuff, but I don't really know how to receive. Well, knowing what's available how to receive it and what to do with it after you've got it in the natural realm seems, uh, well, it seems pretty simple. After all, we're taught that from an early age uh, that when we want to eat, we just ask for it. When we want to fix dinner, well, we went to the store and we bought the food or obtained it from our gardens and brought it in and prepared it. However, many of us don't know what's available spiritually, let alone how to receive it or what to do with it after we've received it. Receiving spiritual things is just as easy as receiving things in the natural realm when we know how. How to receive it. Well, how do we receive it? After we learn what's available in God's Word, we need to know how to appropriate it, how to receive it, and what's more, even desire it. Receiving God's promises are just as simple as receiving things in the natural realm. We have actually learned that an abundant life is available, but we don't know how to receive it. Well, it does me very little good to know what an abundant life is like and that it's available if I don't know how to receive it and what to do with it after I've got it. Matthew 6, verse 31 says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or, What shall we drink? Or, Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth what you need, and, uh, and what, and, your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things then shall be added unto you. How am I going to get all my needs met? Seek first God. Believe his word. Don't, be, don't go around fretting about where your next meal is going to come from or where the clothes you're going to wear are coming from. Why? Because God's going to provide it all. Now Luke 6.38 tells us, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. That's another key to living the more and abundant life. Listen, this is more than just having your needs met, folks. Give God and God shall give to you. Fill up your cup with an excellent amount, not just enough to get by, 
No, it says good measure, pressing it down, shaking it together to settle it and get all the air out and having more put in on top of that so that it runs over. That's our God. These are just a few of the principles that we need to know, believe, and do in order to tap into the resources of the more than abundant life that God has provided for us. You know, God tells us in Ephesians 6 how to combat the wiles of the devil, and he has given us the tools to do it with. And he tells us what to do with the tools. God instructs us in Romans 8 on how to renew our minds and pray so that we can walk with our Father and live a live, lively life, not consumed by the carnal things of this world. We can be told that we should pray. We can be told that we should give. We can be told that we should renew our minds. But that'll never do us any good unless we're told how to do it, how to receive and have the desire. This is what we need to know. We need to know how to receive the abundance in God's word. So what do we do with it after we've got it? Let's say that we find out how to receive it and we get it. Now we also need to know what to do with it after we've got it. What good is it, or what is it to profit, if I receive things from God, but I don't know how to use them? Well, in the natural realm, if you knew a, gar knew a garden hoe was available, and you obtained one, but you used it as a shovel, well, it wouldn't work very well, would it? This is the same principle in the spiritual realm. You can receive the gift of God, which is the Holy Spirit, and well-meaning people will tell you, Hooray, you've got it. You've got the power now. However, if you don't know what to do with the power, and if you don't know that you have it, but it's like a nuclear bomb and you're afraid to move or, or you may set it off, you'll never use it. But more to the point, after you've got it, you can't use it to its fullest potential if you have no idea what it does or what to expect from having used it. So, what do we do? Well, we have to find out how we appropriate the things of God and what to do with those things of God after we've received them. And this will allow us to tap into the resources of the more than abundant life. Here's a great example of what's available, how to receive it, what to do with it after you've got it, all rolled into one. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. What's available? The manifestations of the Spirit of God. How to receive it? It is given to, to us when we were made whole, born again. Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. What to do with it? To use, to profit with all, to be altogether profitable. The uses, for one, uh, 12, 8, for, for to one prophet is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom. To another prophet, the word of God, by the same Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about a prophet, Speaking prophet, I'm talking about P-R-O-F-I-T, you know, gain. Okay, uh, so to another prophet, the word of knowledge by the same spirit. To another prophet, faith by the sp same spirit. To another prophet, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. To another prophet, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, uh, a discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally his own, as he, the man, will. As the desire to. Has a desire to. Okay, so you, you have to desire it. In order to tap into the resources of the more abundant, or more than abundant life, I should say, we need the tools to do it. Now, the nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit are the tools that we use to live that more than abundant life that God has promised us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 For we are all his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk with in them Now when we're born again of God's spirit we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works period simple this is what you do with it after you've got it 2 Timothy 3:16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thor thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now God has given us his word directly from him so that we can have the doctrine, reproof, and correction, which is instruction in right living, so that we may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now the good works don't come first. God has given us his word and Holy Spirit so that we may have the ability to do the good works. How are we going to find out what's available from God, how to receive it, and what to do with it after we've got it?
We have to go to God's word, which is his will, and let it speak for itself. People may tell us many things from the word of what or what God does or doesn't do, but we need to see it from the word or for ourselves. Jesus said, it is written. We need to get to the place where we can also say, it is written. We need to know from God's word what his will is, how to receive his promises, and what to do with them after we've got them. And the only way that we're going to know God's will is to go to God's word. Dr. V.P. Weiler, Weiler uh, Weirwell, <laughs> I'm sorry, W-I-E-R, W-I-L-L-E, Weirwell, said frequently that the Bible is revealed the re is the revealed word of God, what it says and says what it means. And God ha has a purpose for everything that he says, where he says it, why he says it, how he says it, when he says it, and to whom he says it. Now, another key that's vitally important to tapping into the resources of the more than abundant life is having your needs and your wants parallel. If your wants are great and your needs are small, you're not lined up properly with God's word. Oh, yes. You'll get answers to prayer if, you're, if, if your needs and wants are balanced with the word. 1 John chapter 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whosoever, or I mean, not who, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We have to ask according to his word. We must put forth the effort to know his word. Matthew 18, verse 19, Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now the word agree is the Greek word symphonio, to agree harmoniously or symphonize. <laughs> I said it right the first time. So when two people agree together, they are in harmony with their needs and wants paralleled. Okay, now, John 14, verse 13, And whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the reason being, in other words, the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, when you ask in the name of Jesus Christ, you are to ask according to God's word so that you may glorify him. See, you're to have your needs and wants paralleled and in line with the Word of God. Now, we must know the Word of God so that we know the will of God. And when we know God's will, we can pray with effectiveness and see signs, miracles, and wonders like God has intended for us to see. One more essential truth that we must believe is that God's ability equals His willingness. If we recognize that God has the ability, after all, He created the heavens and the earth, uh, but we don't believe that He's willing, our unbelief will defeat the promises of God in our lives. We have to believe that what God says he's willing to do and he's able to do. The converse is also true. We must believe that God says that what God says he's able to do, he's willing to do. Anytime anyone tells you that God can or cannot do something, we must look into his word to know the truth. Men will exhibit unwillingness, but not God. Men may see another uh, have a need, but be unwilling to help. Men may also be willing to help but lack the resources to help. But if I need to dig a ditch and you had a backhoe, you could come to me and say, I can help you with your ditch, but I don't want to. <laughs> okay. You have the ability, but not the willingness. Now, if you don't have a backhoe or shovel and come to me willing to help but don't have the resources, you can't help. God's not this way. What God says is available from his word. He's able to do, and he's also willing to do it. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus, and we are his children called before the foundations of the world. Why would he not take care of us? Abraham was given a promise from God, and he believed God was able and willing to perform it. Now, God told Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations when he was 75 years old. Genesis 12. God says to of Abraham, Romans 4.19, And being not weak in faith, believing... He, Abraham, considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Now God told Abraham that when he was 75 that he was going to be the father of many nations. When he was about a hundred, Isaac was born. He didn't look at the circumstances. He didn't consider that he was old and that Sarah was barren. He held fast to God's word and was fully persuaded that what God had promised him, God was able to perform. 
And was God willing? You bet he was. God was willing and able to perform his promise. And Abraham wasn't the only one who had to believe God's promise and he and be confident that God would perform it. Hebrews 11.11 11 says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. She was 90. Now, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Okay, Sarah believed that God was able and willing to perform the promise that he gave to Abraham. We have to also realize that God's not a man that he should lie. What God says he means. Numbers 23 verse 9, uh, or 19 I mean, uh, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? What God gives he doesn't retract either. Romans 11 verse 29, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. We can be confident in the gifts and the calling of God. What he promises he'll perform and what he gives he doesn't take away. He honors those that believe and perform his word. Now, the word of God, which is God's will, contains the resources for us to live a, a, a life that is more than abundant. We have to obtain the keys to receiving the promises of God. We have to find out what's available, how to receive it, what to do with it after we've got it. We must have our needs and wants paralleled with the word, and we must recognize that God's ability equals his willingness. We will then be on the road to living a life that is more than abundant. Now, my friends, I want you to understand that this is a series, and I always start out with a little bit of an overview. Did I answer your question? No, but I'm going to over the next few weeks. So hang in there, stay with us, and come back next Sunday, and we'll go over it again, and we'll pick up and pick out one thing and talk about it, and we'll develop this as we go. But right now, this may be your, your time, my friends. This may be the moment for you appointed by God to make a decision for Christ. So, listen, dear ones. If the Lord's speaking to your heart tonight, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ, become a child of God, and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom and his power, then you must give your life to him. It's very simple and it's pain-free. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity. Sin would 
would be too much for you to take me as I am. But all the blood of Christ that washes over me, flowing from your hands, your feet, I don't have to. Love came for me. Love rescued me. Love called my name. Love took my place. Sweet Lamb of God, I'm bowing down. My eyes have seen. This manger king, my everything, love came for me. If you would like to know Christ as Lord and Savior, sincerely with heartfelt repentance, come before the Lord with a contrite heart, which means a crushed, crippled, and a broken heart, a repentful heart, a remorseful heart. And pray with me right now and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior as you repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. And Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, your direction, your provision, and your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, if you prayed that prayer with me and you believe what you prayed, then you're saved. Welcome to the family of God. Rejoice. Go to see my son This manger for your bed You have a long road before you rest Your little head Can you feel Does the Father guard your heart for now so you can sleep tonight? Go to sleep, my son. Go and chase your dreams. This world can wait. For one more moment, go and sleep in peace. I believe the glory of heaven 
One of the wonderful things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and minds. We must prepare before taking Holy Communion. And in that preparation, you need to understand something about our use of the elements of the covenant. Jesus and his disciples had bread and wine on the table when they shared the Last Supper. The meal itself had come to an end, and some of the food that was left on the table was bread and wine. Now, these items were familiar to all of them, and because those particular items were used to draw the picture that Jesus wanted them to see, we used those same items. However, remember that it doesn't matter what food items you use. Use what you have available to you. It's perfectly acceptable. Why? Because we pray over those items, sanctifying them as the body and the blood of Christ. So what I want you to see in this is that you believe that they become the body and the blood of Christ. Now, the Word of God tells us that the first thing that we must do is discern the body of Christ. How do we do that? Well, we do that by acknowledging that the bread or whatever food item you're using is the body of Christ. And it's the vibrancy of the life of Jesus and his supernatural healing and wholeness that because of his body and blood, you supernaturally have become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. That you're now filled with his perfection and power, completely healed, completely made whole, completely restored to divine health. You could think of it as a medicine, actually, if you want to, a pill that's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. And every time you take it, that medicine is healing you as it travels through your mouth, down into your body. And as it goes, it's pushing out all darkness, which is sickness and disease, and it's pushing it out from the inside out. Now visualize the condition you're plagued with. Uh, that sickness, disease, being on Jesus' Jesus's body. Put whatever those ailments are on him. Use your imagination and remember this. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, remember? Now the enemy is trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking that you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it at the cross, you're already healed and made whole. So put that lying symptom back on Jesus, right in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, my friends, see yourself with the solution. See yourself without the problems. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vital you understand it and do it. Listen, if you've been diagnosed with a problem and are being treated by a doctor, then continue your treatment and medications. But add to it your faith and your taking of Holy Communion for healing and restoration. Remember, too, that we believe in doctors. Don't just try to believe away your situation. See a doctor, get a name for what's plaguing you. Why? Because everything with a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. Now, next thing we do in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We actually discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future, as restoration of the blessing to your life, the, the power and the authority of God in your life in full operation, as receiving God's provision and protection, as receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus the Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption, and that you've even been included in it. Thank him that you have been uh, uh, 
given life, eternal life, life everlasting. And now you no longer live under the law, but you live under his grace. Now lift up the elements of the covenant before the Lord. These are the items I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this food item becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. Father, you know we thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his healing bod uh, body or his healing body. I'm sorry, his cleansing blood. That we're continually washed in the waterfall of that blood and renewed within as we continually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. Lord, in the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship, my friends. It's a partnership with Christ. Partaking of one bread creates partnership between the members, the disciples as well, and it merges us into one body, the church. Now the word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Continually take the bread, give thanks, and break it. Eat it, and then take the cup, give thanks, and drink it. All in the remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. And the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often, and yet Paul doesn't give us instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, but he does imply that it's to be done with frequency, so that partaking of the Lord's Supper will continually recall to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. So do it as often as you want to and need to. Remember, too, that you don't need a priest. You don't need a minister or a pastor to administer Holy Communion to you. We who are born again are members of the royal priesthood, and therefore we've been given the authority and right by God to administer Holy Communion to ourselves and others. Now, as we're instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you that this food item has become the bread of life and is now the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus broken for you so that every cell, every tissue, every organ and bone, all systems, cardiovascular, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all systems are totally aligned with God's word and his will that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer of the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become the precious saving blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus, shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, for the remission of all your sins, past, present, and future, and the restoration of the empowerment of God, the blessing in your life, and the gift of righteousness. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. The Lord's Supper is a feast, my friends, a feast in union with the believers and the living Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits, and we are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life, and for that we are eternally grateful.
Now, raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare who you are in Christ Jesus, thanking God for all that you've received and give honor, glory, and praise to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. In the name and majesty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, amen. God bless you.